Thank you, Chairman, sir. Um, uh, thanks, Professor Minora, for that uh, 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 good note. Uh, I must thank Japan Foundation and IDSA, particularly to uh, DDG, sir, for supporting the symposium. It's happening because of the everybody's participation. Uh, actually, I haven't uh, contributed much to this symposium. Uh, we heard uh, many speakers speaking in this session and also in the inauguration ses uh, inaugural session, ambassador speaking. Uh, let me start with this observation. I think uh, whenever we are talking about India-Japan relation, and uh, I think there is a, always a strong reference on China. And I think this uh, reference is uh, natural, uh, given the kind of uh, power China is emerging. And as Professor Minora mentioned in his presentation that uh, I think uh, the geopolitics of the regions is heavily influenced by China's rights, and uh, it is obvious that uh, China is a strong factor in India-Japan relation. And we know for a fact that I think uh, uh, bilateral relations in international politics do not exist in isolation. And we know for a fact that uh, there are external determinants are there which actually heavily influence the bilateral relations in international relations. Um, we have seen that geography and geographical determinants uh, heavily influencing the geopolitics, and therefore China, as a, as a, as a decider in many, many ways, heavily influenced the India-Japan relations. And I think uh, we do all acknowledge that uh, in India-Japan relations, China is a factor. If we do really acknowledge that China is a factor, I think we need to go a little further to you know, talk about this debate. To what extent China is really an influencing factor? And how much India-Japan relationship is really China-centric? And I think that this is not an uh, easy question to answer. I think we need empirical research. Uh, we need uh, brainstorming, uh, longer brainstorming, and we need uh, policy forethoughts to come into a conclusion uh, on this debate. But uh, let me address this questions, uh, this debate in my presentation. To what extent India-Japan relationship is influenced by China? And how the uh, triangularity involving China, India-Japan-China tri triangularity in Indo-Pacific regions is going to influence if China is a factor. I think there are many ways at looking at it, as I mentioned. Uh, probably it will take uh, uh, months to do a proper research to figure it out with uh, China really influencing India-Japan relation. But uh, on a day when we are here uh, to talk about uh, different narratives, uh, in, in a shorter uh, time framework. I think one way of looking at it would be, I think, to look at their national perspective of each of these countries, the national perspective of China, the national perspective of Japan, and the national perspective of India. And how do they really see each other? And how do they really position themselves in these Indo-Pacific regions? And uh, then we can probably uh, figure it out how this triangularity involving India, Japan, China is emerging, and where does really China figure in India-Japan relation? If we talk about the national perspective or national planning, I think um, we do see that there is a new China emerging under Xi Jinping. And then this uh, 19th uh, National Congress has, uh, in, a, in a way, has uh, made a new beginning to China and China's entry to global politics. We saw that uh, Xi Jinping delivering one of the longest speech in Chinese history. For me, as a, as a China observer, I think um, for me, it is not the longevity of this speech which was really impressive. For me, I think the, the, the kind of thought Xi Jinping brought in his speech, the kind of pragmatism he brought in, in his speech, that was outstanding. It was outstanding in the sense that if you see the speech which has been de delivered by Mao, the speech which has been uh, delivered by Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, I think Xi Jinping really talked about both the positivity and negativity of China, where China has really gone ahead or move, move ahead, and where China is really struggling. And I think that really uh, explains a lot about the Chinese thought process today under Xi Jinping. And in that speech, he categorically mentioned uh, about the, the, the different kind of challenges and progresses China has made domestically and internationally. But one thing which was a referring point and which is central to my talk is that he talked about China moving into a new era. And he mentioned about the new era plan that the Chinese are having. Now, obviously, the question remains that what is this new era is really all about? I think if we, if we go into the details of Xi Jinping and try to understand in Chinese narratives, I think he was obviously talking about an old era. 
and that old era was that he talked about two uh, two old eras. One era was which was belongs to Mao Zedong. That was that how Chinese have really overcome the centuries of humiliations and struggle, and finally they established the PRC People's Republic of China. The second era he was referring about Tang Xiaoping, the the reform and opening up strategy of Tang Xiaoping. So in that context, I think he was he was quite categorically that China has moved ahead from those two eras, and now have entered into a new era where China is emerging as a stronger country. And in that speech, he talked about in last five years what China has actually achieved under his leadership and how China is going to proceed forward. And I think that need a little bit debate because uh, as, as it was uh, mentioned uh, by my two fellow colleagues here, I think one of the uh, one of the core to this new era strategy or new era plan of Xi Jinping is the Belt and Road Initiative. That is one of the central initiative of Xi Jinping and that's what he is talking about from 2013 and 14 onwards. If we talk about Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative, I have written in other forums that I think now the, the initiative has moved to the second stage. Uh, the, the first stage from 2013 onwards till today, uh, till uh, May 2017, we could consider it as uh, we could consider it as the first phase of BRI, where a lot of campaigning was there involved. Uh, a lot of campaigning was involved in promoting the BRI as an international initiative. Later on, what we saw from this year onwards, China putting forward and inducting BRI into the Chinese constitution, and it is marking as a uh, it marked as a kind of a beginning of a second stage of a BRI implementation. But why I am really mentioning BRI? Uh, I'm, I'm really mentioning uh, BRI in this context, in the context of India, Japan, China, because it actually talks about the politics that is involved in the regions. And if we talk about BRI and China's new era plan, there are three things which are key to China's uh, international positioning in Indo-Pacific regions and outside. One, infrastructure. And I think that is key. And if you see in last 10 to 12 years, at least since uh, Hu Jintao's time, the Chinese are building a lot of infrastructure in the Indian Ocean regions. In last 14 years, they have gone into establishing 16 uh, bases in the uh, Indian Ocean regions. Some of, the, some of these bases are uh, patrolling stations. Some of these uh, bases are uh, ports, uh, um, jointly constructed ports. And some of these uh, bases are actually emerging as military bases. Uh, and that uh, explains the, the way Chinese are looking at the initiatives of infrastructure. So infrastructure is one of those key aspects of China's new era plan strategy. The second is the promoting China's national interest. And I think that is key because uh, what Chinese are saying uh, through its leadership is that they want to really promote China as the drivers of globalization. And um, while they are talking about uh, you know, taking the leadership of this globalized world. They are also mentioning that uh, they would not really be compromising on their national sovereignty issue, on their national security issues, or on territorial issues. And that has obvious implications for India, Japan, and Indo-Pacific regions. And if you see his speech, he has categorically mentioned about sovereignty issue. He has categorically mentioned about, uh, you know, national security issues. And he has also mentioned that uh, China would like to have a peaceful resolution to the dispute without really making uh, any compromise to its national interest. And that has obvious implications for India, Japan, and ASEAN countries, because we are the regions uh, which are involved with China on a, on a range of disputes. The third point, I think, in his uh, new era plan is, I think, uh, is the grand ideas, what Xi Jinping is actually throwing to the region and to the world. If you see, I think, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, in my conversation uh, with my fellow colleagues uh, in the institute and with uh, esteemed chairpersons uh, here, is that I think the Chinese have been one of those uh, uh, people, or China has been one of those countries, is that um, they have been very forthcoming in offering ideas to the world. And if you see, Belt and Road Initiative is not simply an initiative on infrastructure. It's also an idea to promote Chinese national interest, and it's also uh, it's also an initiative which comes with a lot of ideas. And therefore, what we see in Xi Jinping's uh, new era plan is, uh, is uh, three key elements, infrastructure, interest, and uh, ideas. If we try to understand from Japan's point of view, I think uh, uh, I would really skip in going to the details of the Japanese uh, 
domestic affairs because uh, I am not really competent to comment on that, uh, those issues. Um, what I learned and gathered from other speakers and from my readings is that I think Japan is undergoing a lot of transformation and that needs to be really noted down. And if you talk about Prime Minister uh, uh, Shinzo Abe, he's also talking about three things, infrastructure, promoting Japan's national interest, and he's also throwing out new ideas, what the Ambassador uh, um, Hiramasu was talking about. If we talk about Japanese initiatives on infrastructure, and I think they have been in some ways, though I would call them uh, to some uh, reactive nation to China, but uh, again, I think they have also taken grand initiatives uh, when it comes to infrastructural planning in the regions and in the world is concerned. Today, what we see that in 2015, the Japanese uh, came out with the grand idea of EPQI, um, Expanded Partnership of uh, Infrastructure, uh, Quality Infrastructure. Um, and uh, in 2016, they, uh, in 2015, they introduced uh, PQI, and in 2016, they revised it at EPQI, Expanded Partnership for Quality Infrastructure. If we talk about that uh, uh, initiative, it is a grand initiative. It actually, the initiative talks about Japan's outreach programs in creating infrastructure and infrastructural developmental planning in the Indo-Pacific regions and beyond the regions. That means today we are again seeing Japan emerging as a resurgent nation in the global affairs, and they are focusing a lot on infrastructure building. The second thing what Shinzo Abe is really talking about is protecting Japan's national interest. And I think that is uh, one of the key. Uh, when he's talking about uh, uh, protecting Japan's national interest, obviously, most of these uh, reforms uh, in terms of uh, the, you know, reforming the security calculus of Japan is concentrated probably on China factor and on the East China Sea front and probably on the North Korean issue. But uh, given the trajectory and given the history that Japan has lived with, I think uh, bringing any kind of change in the security calculation, uh, calculation of Japan is a big change. And uh, there we saw that, uh, you know, uh, Shinzo Abe is very forthcoming and very forwarding to talk about changing the cha Japan's national security discourse, changing, uh, you know, uh, reforming the pacifist constitution, Article 9. And all of this indicates that, uh, you know, Japan is on the threshold today when it uh, comes to the security issues and protecting Japan's national interest. The third point is, uh, again, Japanese throwing the big ideas to the regions. Uh, as it was mentioned by earlier speakers and uh, uh, Ambassador Hiramasu, that I think they have been keenly promoting this idea of free and Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific regions, and that's a key, a key idea to the region. Let me briefly talk about India. Where does India stand in this trilateral framework? I think the similar kind of narratives we are seeing in India's National Construct today under Prime Minister Modi. Of course, one might agree, what might not be agree, and that's a debatable issue. But again, we are seeing a lot of infrastructural initiatives is being taken by the current government uh, <laughs> under the India First approach. Uh, there is initiatives on the domestic infrastructure. There is initiatives on the neighborhood infrastructure. Uh, we have Sagarmala project. We have Setu uh, uh, Bharatam project. We have uh, Bharatmala project. Uh, we have Sagar initiatives. And all of these infrastructural projects based on the Indian Ocean uh, regions. Uh, we are also a country emerging uh, to not to compromise on our national interest. Of course, it goes with uh, any country to say that uh, no country would like to, you know, compromise on their national interest. But I think Prime Minister Modi made a statement during the Doklam's uh, issue. Uh, India is not going to compromise on its uh, national interest. Similarly, India is also promoting key ideas, be it uh, Asian equilibrium or uh, bringing equality or say shared uh, you know, shared leadership in Asia. He made this statement uh, during his uh, visit to China. And all of these actually initiatives are being take, taken strong, uh, taken a strong note in China and in other countries. So to sum up, I think if you see in the context of Indo-Pacific, and this map actually explains a lot. This map is about Asia-Africa growth corridor. I'm not going to touch upon that issue because one of our experts uh, present here, uh, she will be talking about this issue um, you know, uh, later in the day. But this map explains where the three countries are today really, uh, you know, uh, really uh, been positioned in the Indo-Pacific construct. 
uh, there is a contest of infrastructure, interest, and ideas emerging between India, Japan, and China, and that needs to be uh, no noted about. My last point is that what should India and Japan uh, therefore need to do? A lot has been talked about by uh, in my uh, uh, by my fellow colleagues here, but let me uh, summarize my my talk by saying that I'm not going to touch upon the domestic aspect of India-Japan ties. What needs to be done? That's uh, there are a lot of other speakers to talk about it. But in the Indo-Pacific regions, there are five things we need to do, uh, and I would try to uh, put it in a in a context of five eyes. One is that we need to really work out together on bringing out uh, cooperation in the on the issue of infrastructure which is my first eye uh, the issue of infrastructure the uh, and there we need to really talk about port construction we need to really talk about harbor we need to talk about um, you know road connectivity in the neighborhood regions uh, the second eye i think is uh, we should have a common integration strategy uh, that's my second eye in, in India-Japan uh, Indo-Pacific region construct. Um, and there we need to have collaborative measures to talk about how we should be talking about regional economic integration strategy. The third one is we should have collaboration on institutions, different institutions, be it Asia-Pacific institutions, Indo-Pacific institutions, or global institutions. Uh, and uh, both India and Japan are G4 members. Fourth, we should have innovative ideas to talk about. And I think Asia Africa Growth Corridor is one of those innovative ideas between it. Fifth, I think most importantly what we need is that a good understanding, uh, information sharing understanding. That is my five eyes, that we should have a robust information sharing understanding between India and Japan. Um, and therefore, I would argue that both India and Japan is having a very good relationship today, but it needs to be enhanced further. And in the context of Indo-Pacific regions, we should have a Indo-Pacific plus strategy. And my five, five eyes are uh, based on this Indo-Pacific plus strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ponda. 